Hi, everybody. Okay, it is um, Tuesday, April 14th today, and um, I hope you are still working on writing your 500 word personal statement, um, which I talked about in yesterday's screencast. So if you missed it, make sure you go back into yesterday's folder and watch that information. It is due Friday at 11.59, submitted via Schoology. I will remind you on Friday how to do that. Um, you can, of course, submit it ahead of time if you want to, or you can go ahead and submit your um, like the rough copy that you're working on today if you want to. Um, and that way you're certain that you have submitted it. At least you have something on Schoology so you get a grade for it and not a zero. Um, so today we are going to be going forward into reviewing rhetorical analysis. And this is from two weeks ago. So last week you had the whole week you were working on SAT review. The week before that, I started the rhetorical analysis review. So if you want to go back to week two's folder and find um, the information about rhetorical analysis review, there are two videos in there. Um, and I don't remember exactly what dates, I'm sorry. Um, but there are two videos in there that kind of talk about, wait, hold on. <laughs> this reading right here, which is from 2017 AP exam, Claire Booth Lucci's um, address speech in front of the Women's National Press Club. And when she was talking about um, what, how journalists had a responsibility to report on actual news and not just things that will sell newspapers. So if you haven't looked at those, make sure you go back and look at those because today we're going to talk about taking that essay and how you would pick out exactly what strategies you would use for it, as well as how you would go ahead and organize a rhetorical analysis essay. By the way, I know that there's probably a couple of you who found rhetorical analysis to be really hard that are worried about the rhetorical analysis essay for the, the AP exam, but I am so excited that it was a rhetorical analysis essay because that's the thing we worked the most on. If you think about it, we started rhetorical analysis from the beginning of the school year, um, and I feel like that's the one skill that is is the thing that we've really hammered on. If it was a synthesis question, we'd have so much more that we'd have to do before you took that exam. All right, so let's talk about Claire Booth Lucci's 2017 speech in front of the National Women's Press. Okay, so here we are. Um, up here, that's the 2017 essay. And then over here, I have prepared a slide show about like steps that you should take when you are working on writing it. So Claire Booth Lucci's pre uh, information in front of the American press, uh, the, the Women's National Press Club. So first of all, these are the, your first step when you get that essay. You have 45 minutes, which means that they're giving you five minutes for reading because otherwise you'd only get 40 minutes so you want to think about okay i've got five free minutes for reading um but i would suggest that you take longer to read and organize your essay than you do to write like to not that you do to write your essay but then just five minutes so i would think to yourself okay 10 minutes i have 10 minutes to read this choose my strategies know exactly what the reading is all about before I start writing anything and even kind of organize what I'm going to write about. So as a review for you, um, I went over and read this. We read half of it one day and we read half of it the other day and we talked about some of these different skills. So some of the things that I saw Claire Bluth Lucci doing was contrast and juxtaposition, um, happy, less happy, less happy, more challenged. Um, in the beginning here when she talks about her role there. And she does a lot of contrast and juxtaposition, honestly, throughout the whole piece. So that's one of the first things that I noticed. Another thing is that she uses a lot of parallel structure. I am happy and flattered, exciting and challenging. So she uses this parallel structure of adjectives to ex describe not only herself, but also the occasion that she starts off with. And she does that like, throughout the speech as well um, that we see that parallel she does like three adjectives here and then three adjectives that follow or that might contrast the adjectives that she used earlier okay 
Then one of the other things she does is she consistently in the beginning here, and then also again at the end, she references the occasion and the purpose and herself as a speaker, as well as who is in the audience. So like in this sentence right here, you have asked me to tell you what's wrong with you, the American press. The subject is not only of great national significance, but also has one should say infinite possibilities and infinite perils to the rock thrower. So again, she goes over what is her role? What was the purpose of this speech? what is the purpose of the audience and what the exact occasion is. And she kind of touches that on that a little bit. Oh, I forgot one in here. I don't know if I can add it, but one of the things that is in here at the end here is that a little touch of humor um, when she refers to Billy Graham and Bishop Sheens as being like giving the audience hell since they are both tele televangelists who, you know, were kind of like fire and brimstone speakers. So they are in there. Okay. Here she uses direct address to her audience, again, referring to the audience, saying you are an audience of journalists. And then she talks about what she knows about them. When you do that in a speech, it kind of helps to open up the audience's eyes that you really understand them, um, especially if you're about to tell them something negative, which they have asked her to do, to tell them what's wrong with them. So obviously that's something kind of negative. All right. Then she uses connotative diction. So she says, for the banquet speakers who criticizes the weaknesses and pretensions or exposes the follies and the sins, see that parallel structure, uh, or structure, weakness, pretension, follies, sins. We've got the, this like pairs versus pairs and those are the same. Um, so those are all negative connotations. Um, kind of like the word choice that she uses really evokes emotion. She doesn't say um, the bad and the good. She says weaknesses and pretensions. She doesn't say mistakes. She says follies and sins, which is that leads her into that biblical reference to Billy Graham and Bishop Sheen. Okay. So connotative diction. She uses an appeal to pathos right here appeal to pathos, asking the audience to be sympathetic to her position as a speaker. I would not just write, she uses an appeal to pathos, I have to write the whole thing. She uses an appeal to pathos, asking the audience to be sympathetic to her position as a speaker. That's the strategy, not just appeal to pathos. Remember, that's an overall term that we never wanna use alone. Okay, then she goes into this right here at the beginning of um, the, fourth paragraph, a rhetorical question, which she then answers. And the rhetorical question allows her audience to think about how they themselves would answer it before she answers it herself. And she uses her answer to provide a contrast between the large and the small, the big um, ideas behind journalism and the small goals of journalism. She also uses anaphora. She repeats, it is the effort to do this, not only in matters of state, diplomacy, blah, 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 blah. It is the effort to explain everything. And then over here, it is the effort to. It is the effort, it is the effort, it is the effort. Anaphora, repetition at the beginning of three successive sentences. That's a huge appeal to pathos because it gets the, it's a creative use of word choice. It's a creative use of diction. It's like, it feels like a sermon, like she's talking to these people like um, Billy Graham and Bishop Sheen. She is giving them hell. It is the effort. It is the effort. It is the effort. That's very popular to use anaphora in speeches. And we saw that in our political speeches. Um, remember how often Barack Obama used repetition like that anaphora. If you don't remember the word anaphora, when you're working on this, you just say repetition. She re repeats the phrase in the effort, in the effort, in the effort, and that is effective because it gets the audience thinking about each thing separately, and it provides a good separation between her thoughts. And then finally, down here, she begins to compliment the audience. So it's an appeal to pathos, 
complementing the audience's role. And she also provides a contrast at the end because she says she has just said all the bad things, but then she says, as much as it may go against your professional grade, if I ask you to accept some of the good with the bad, even though it may, may not make such good copy for your newspapers, the plain fact is that the U.S. Daily Press today is not only inspiringly good, it is just far and away the best press in the world. So it is not inspiring, inspiringly good. It is the best press in the world. So that's the contrast. And she ends on a, on a high note instead of constantly um, like picking on them. And that you know allows them to cheer. Who wouldn't cheer at the end if you said you're the best press in the world? All right, so that's a little review of the piece. So you reading closely, you mark all the strategies and you think overall specific purpose. Her purpose is to get them to understand why they need to start writing journalism in their papers that is news, that is important journalism, and not just something that will sell newspapers. We get that partially from up here, the information from up here in the um, the preview to what it is that you're going to read, but we also get that by reading it over, um, that we know that you have to be able to get the tough stories out there, the ones not only that the things that people need to hear, not just what they want to hear. And that's what she's basically saying that they should do. Okay, so think about the overall specific purpose as you're going through it and you're looking for strategies. Okay, your next step is to narrow down which strategies you're going to use. And what I always say is you want to do these two things. Choose strategies that either you believe have the most impact. I think juxtaposition and contrast in this one has a lot of impact. I think that um, when she gets into this section, like the meat answering the question, the rhetorical question with the use of the repetition and then contrasting the big purposes and the small purposes behind journalism, I think that's really important. Connects best with the purpose. I think that section does that too, but so does the um, referencing the speaker and the occasion does that too. You want to think about things that are used consistently. So one of the thing we saw, things we saw used consistently throughout this was connotative diction, using word choice that really packs an emotional appeal. And that's really important to journalists because journalists are writers and writers love words. So you're not going to get someone standing up in front of you telling you things with like boring diction, right? Connotative diction, diction that patch packs and emotional punch is really important to this, but also used throughout it was juxtaposition and contrast. So again, I'm going to want to use that. Choose strategies you feel you can write about, oh, and then can take you through the whole essay. So you want to talk about the beginning, the middle, and the end. You want them to know that you've read the whole essay and you understand it as a whole, that you're not just going to be writing about strategies in the beginning. Um, so you want to think about the whole thing. So you also want to think about, is this a strategy that I can write about that specific, that I can specifically explain why the author used it at that place in the essay and the letter and the speech? Like, why was it important there? Why is it important that she uses so many rhetorical strategies in this section? Well, it's because that's the meat of her, of her speech. That's the message right there. Everything else is kind of leading up to it and then leading away from it. So she kind of goes towards it, gives her meat, and then kind of moves away from it. Okay. So um, Emerson asked me uh, common strategies that you should review before you take the AP exam. So these are common strategies that you're going to find in many, many different uh, speeches, not just this one. So I'm going to make myself a little bit bigger here off to the side here, because you don't need to see that anymore. So you want to think of the strategies that authors use as being basically threefold. There are evid evidential strategies, strategies that show evidence. There's reasoning strategies, strategies that give like the argument or the reason that you're writing what you're writing. And then there are stylistic strategies, strategies that are used like um, the anaphora or the connotative diction or things like that, that really pack an emotional punch. Those writing style strategies are the ones that usually appeal to emotion and the evidence and reasoning typically appeal to logic and all three of them appeal to ethos. All right. So evidence, remember anecdotal evidence is when you tell a personal story about yourself or you tell a story about someone like this man I met or 
this person that I once knew, or you know how um, most presidents during their State of the Union address, they invite specific citizens there, usually heroes or someone that they want to recognize, and they talk about that person's story. That's anecdotal evidence. It doesn't have to be your specific story, a story, a personal story about a person. Okay. Historical evidence, bringing evidence from history um, could include things like brings up the Declaration of Independence or, you know, something along those lines, but it could also be like events that happened in history that kind of prove the point of the speaker. Scientific evidence, that's evidence that shows like things that have been proven through science and through um, experiments and things like that, theories, et cetera. Statistical evidence is evidence that has numbers in it. One out of four Americans believe blah, 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 blah. So pointing out evidence that's something that isn't really used in this reading, it's not really heavily based on evidence. So you have to think of the type of reading that it is to decide, is this a reading where a lot of evidence is used in there? If it is, then yes, you absolutely want to point out the evidence that's being used. The next part is reasoning. And that's kind of like you want to think about how it's organized. Um, and you may not, there may not be a very logical organization. This one, I think, has a touch of Rogerian argumentation to it, where she brings up the opposing side and what they might be thinking in the beginning. And that kind of helps butter up the audience a little bit to the like harsher thing that she's going to say to them. Okay. So you could talk about logical progression, how she progresses from one idea to the next throughout the piece. If there's something written in chronology that's in time frame, like first, second, third, or in 1972, and then in 1987, and then once again in 2007, then you talk about the, how it's set up, organized by chronology. If there's, if it's an essay that is cause and effect or problem solution, you definitely want to mention that the essay is set up that presents a problem in the beginning and a solution later on. Um, and then you can go into the different argumentation styles, classical argumentation, introduction, background, um, the person's claims, counterclaim, conclusion, or Rogerian argumentation, where the counterclaim comes first. You represent, you explain what the opposing side's view is first, and then you present your own and then you work toward a compromise. Or like major paper three was written in Toulmin argumentation, where there is an argument and then it's always followed by a counter argument. Another thing you can always bring up is when you see a reference to the counter argument or the opposing viewpoint or the audience's viewpoint or whatever it is that might be different from the speakers, you bring that up there and that's an example of using reasoning. Finally, common strategies include for writing style, things that we, you could see in almost any writing is contrast. You can refer to it as contrast or juxtaposition if the ideas are small and very close to each other. Um, contrast is a fine general term which will work wonders. You don't have to worry about, is this contrast? Is this antithesis? Is it paradox? Contrast works okay. Um, rhetorical questions, you see a lot of those. So understanding rhetorical questions, why they're used in general and why they're used specifically in the piece is important. Um, repetition, different types of repetition. If you can name them, anaphora, anadiplosis, antistrophe, awesome. But if you can't saying, like explaining the repetition, repetition at the beginning of successive sentences or repetition at the end of different phrases, you can say that. A lot of authors love to use imagery, um, connotative diction. We've talked about that already. Reference to the audience, the speaker, the occasion. I showed you that in Claire Booth Lucci's speech. Um, Metaphor, simile, comparison, if you see comparisons or metaphors or things like that, you want to mention them if they are important to the purpose. Um, the type of diction that it is, is it formal or elevated diction? Um, you want to think about the time period, though. If something is written in 1770 or 1780, like Abigail Adams' letter to her son, um, and you refer to it as being, I think some kids use the word archaic diction, it's only archaic to us. That was how they spoke. So you remember if you're writing about something from the past, it's not archaic diction, but it could be elevated or more formal diction than we expect today. Direct address is when the writer specifically addresses the audience as like you. And we see that happening in Claire Booth Lucci's essay right here, um, direct address. 
Oh, I have imagery on there twice, but imagery is important if you see a lot of imagery and description. And then appeals to pathos. Remember, if you see appeals to pathos, they are appeals to pathos through a strategy, one of these listed over there, or appeals to pathos through some sort of emotion. So the writer appeals to pathos through a patriotic feeling that he wants his audience to feel and understand as well. All right, this I'm going to be putting on the Schoology main page, this common strategies, to remind you to review those and make sure that you know what each of those are before you take the AP exam, because those are the common ones I would suggest. Finally, and I'll put this one up there too, the organization for your um, essay. First paragraph, as you're writing it, you wanna grab attention with the specific subject matter. So this one is about journalism. So when I start writing this, I'm gonna write something about like the role of journalists today or the role of journalists in society through time. Journalism has always played an important role in our society because Journalists and the news act as a check and balance on our political system. So I might you know, start off by explaining journalism. The subject, not the exact purpose of this essay, but the subject of that essay. Then have a soap statement where you get to be more specific. That goes from general subject matter of the essay to specific purpose of this essay and make sure you have a nice transition between the two. Tomorrow we'll be reviewing the soap statements and we'll do it with this guy. Okay, so then the next paragraphs are about writing about all the different strategies in order as they appear in the essay. Don't write about a strategy yet at the end and then jump around back to the beginning. Go in order as you see them in the essay. That's why I'm, it's important for you to organize first before you begin writing. Also make sure when you write about the strategies, you always talk about why the author used that specific strategy in the place of the essay that they did and why it was important. And then a conclusion isn't really necessary. If you run out of time on these and you don't get to a conclusion, don't beat yourself up. But if you do write a conclusion, you express the importance of the piece to the world at the time that it was written or today. So today I would talk about how there's more attacks being made on journalism because of the concept of fake news than there ever has been before, but also that journalists today are maybe are guilty often of allowing their own political opinions to play a role in their reports. And that's, you know, like what would Claire Booth Lucci say today to American journalists? Um, I think she would say, remember that you are here to present the story and not to take a side. And so maybe that would be something that I could put in the conclusion. Okay, I'm hoping this was helpful. I know it was really long, but it'll give you a good review. Tomorrow we're going to review soapstone statements and we're going to write, I'm going to have you write a soap statement for this essay, Claire Booth Lucci's um, Address to the Women's National Press Club. Okay. Have yourselves a good day. Um, don't forget to watch the YouTube video down below about college applications. And then there's a small assignment, a small Schoology assignment about rhetorical analysis review that will also be posted below the YouTube video. So make sure you do that as well. And work on your personal statements. Okay, bye-bye.